So I'm just going to introduce our guests this evening. Ashley Clark is the Curatorial Director of the Criterion Collection. Previously, he worked as Director of Film Programming at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and he's curated film series at BFI Southbank, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, Tiff Bell Lightbox, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, among other venues. He has contributed writing to publications including the New York Times, Vulture, Sight and Sound, Four Columns, and The Guardian, and he maintains a semi-regular column on non-fiction film by Ashley Clark for Field of Visions Field Notes Journal. He is the author of the book Facing Blackness, Media Minstrelsy in Spike Lee's Bamboozled from 2015. And then we have Charlotte Cook is the co-founder and executive producer of Field of Vision, a film unit that supports and commissions filmmakers and artists to make short film, short form, episodic and feature length creative documentaries. Prior to Field of Vision, she was director of programming at Hot Docs. And in, in addition to her work at Field of Vision, Charlotte is currently a programmer at CPH Docs in Copenhagen and recently produced Do Not Split, for which she was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, so now I'm delighted to hand over to Charlotte and Ashley. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to start with a really obvious question, but it is a question we get all the time and because there's no obvious path to the work that we do. What drew you to curation and film programming and how did your kind of career begin in that way? Big question. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, I think I never quite know where to begin um, with this kind of question. I could go all the way back to falling in love with now that's what I call music 12 at the age of three. And, and trying to figure out why certain things were put in a certain order, why Jive Bunny ran into Phil Collins and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I think I, I, I look back at those days of, of discovering art and, and trying to figure out why things were, were put together. Um, and I, I, I kind of give, I think about that for why I have such a Catholic taste. Um, I don't mean the religion, I just mean in terms of not, not separating between high and low culture. Um, getting an enthusiasm from a really early age for wanting to share things that I was um, passionate about and not being not being backward about that, which can be sometimes quite difficult in the UK, I think, that to, to be open, enthusiastic about things can be um, looked at in a slightly funny way. Um, but that, that was the very, very early days. And then um, I started working, leaping way forward at the British Film Institute in 2009 um, as a press and publicity intern. Uh, where I was working, I think, first at the London Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, as it was known then, um, and, you know, finding out a bit about the institution, burning screeners, uh, collating press clippings and, and what, what have you, and, and figuring that out and looking from the inside at how a festival was run, um, how you had to interact with filmmakers, how you had to organise things, make sure that things ran on time make sure that the, the, the screeners and the DCPs and the prints were all in and, and essentially see how that sausage was made uh, behind the scenes. I found that really interesting. Um, at the same time as I was doing my marketing job at the BFI, um, I, I started going along to um, sessions that David Somerset, um, who, who runs the African Odyssey program um, at the BFI, was, um, he was running. And African Odysseys is a once monthly program at the BFI, which is still going today, um, which focuses on films by and about people of the African diaspora. So it had quite a broad remit. It could be um, films from the continent of Africa. It could be African-American cinema, Black British, Caribbean, whatever. And kind of un unusually, um, this, this program was put together um, by a steering group. So it wasn't programmed in a conventional way, but it was a group that would meet semi-regularly um, a group comprised of um, authors, poets, academics, teachers, activists, all, all united with a, a love of film and visual cultures. Um, and we kind of sit together and um, eat crisps <laughs> and, and um, drink soda and, and discuss what we were interested in. And out of that um, came this program um, that, as I said, was a once monthly thing and it was very diverse in what it was uh, putting out into the world. Um, and that was where I kind of got my, my break, as it were, in, in terms of the present, presenting side of programming. So I, I picked a couple of films that um, I'd been, that I'd read about in, in books and never seen. So it was exciting to be able to 
find out who had this print of, of such and such film. I screened uh, a film called Chameleon Street by Wendell B. Harris from 1989-1990, um, which uh, won the, the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance Film Festival and then basically disappeared off the face of the earth. So I was in touch with, um, excuse me, in touch with Wendell to find out where, where the film was. It has since been uh, restored and the, the restoration recently premiered at the New York Film Festival, which is very exciting. Um, and in a similar vein, a film called Sidewalk Stories by Charles Lane, um, which also has subsequently had a, um, a restoration and, and a wider release. And in both occasions, I had the opportunity to go up and introduce the film, um, to kind of speak to the audience, to have that five, six minutes of, of framing and contextualizing the film, giving the audience things to look out for, uh, and then afterwards doing the Q&As. And, and I started to get a feel for the idea of um, public presentation and, and how kind of important that was to, to have that as part of your arsenal as a programmer. I'm sure that something we'll come to is what does programming actually mean for people looking to get into it. It's extremely nebulous. And I think it depends on what in institution you're at. If you're, if you're a freelancer, you can be a total one man band doing everything from uh, a one person band doing everything from licensing, booking, um, tracking things down, presenting, writing program notes. If you're working with an institution, you might be fortunate enough to have a program planning department that does licensing and tracking down and accounts for you. Um, so there was all of that happening. And then in tandem, I think that the thing that really broke it for me was when I was working at the Clapham Picture House in London, I was working just um, trying to support my, my freelance writing career at the time, tearing tickets, um, ushering, making really bad cocktails for people. Um, and I had the idea to put on a screening of, of Spike Me's Do the Right Thing, because it was a film that had changed my life in terms of understanding how film could, um, I guess, how, how art and politics could mix. I think up to that point, film had probably been more of a source of just entertainment for me. But to see a film that, that had such a, a political and um, socially conscious and explosive content allied and indivisible from the art was a really big deal for me. So that was obviously a film from an early age that I wanted to share with other people. So I put on the screening at the Clapham Picture House in, I think, 2012, uh, injected a bit of showmanship in it by buying lots of pizza out of uh, my own pocket um, to give that authentic vibe of, yeah, a really authentic New York vibe, Clapham, Clapham High Street pizza for the audience. Um, but it was great, you know, 100 people turned up and I got into this habit that I still do to this day when I'm presenting films of, um, especially if it's a repertory film, not a new film, of course, but when I'm speaking, when I'm interacting with the audience, I'll often ask, um, you know, hands up, who's seen this, who's seen this for the first time or who's seen this before? And I don't do that to shame people um, to say, yeah, how can you not, how can you have uh, missed this great piece of artwork? But, uh, but from the other perspective, it's really nice to unite people in a sense of discovery. And when a lot of people are discovering a, a piece of art for the first time, that they're that sense of unity, excuse me, can be really exciting. And that, that was one of the first things that I'd individually put on. And I remember standing at the back of the auditorium and watching the audience watch the film for two hours and watching them physically react to the way that the film um, changes in tone, do the right thing from a very kind of gentle, almost easy ensemble comedy in the first half. And then the, the tension ratchets up gradually and it reaches that explosive climax. And you're seeing almost physical um, responses in the audience, or not almost, truly physical responses, and particularly what happens towards the end of the film. And at that point, w when that film finished and I saw people coming out looking really shaken and looking like they'd had their lives changed, I thought, okay, this, this is something I'd like, really like to do and take seriously and find out more about. Um, so that is a very, very um, all-encompassing, a rather large nutshell. I love it. Um, you you also given away... You've given away two like programmer tricks there, which is one, the idea of saying who hasn't seen a film for an older film is really a lovely experience for the filmmaker if they're there, because I think often they think, oh, why are people showing up? Everyone knows this film and often it's new people. So it kind of energizes a screening when it's an older film, I think sometimes. And then also, I think, especially if there are younger film um, programmers watching, standing at the back watching the audience is one of the best things you can ever do. It's like, that's how you find the love for this, I think. Um, so if the screening is going well, I should add. If yeah. they're yes. kind of filing out one by one, <laughs> True. it's not, not quite as fun. True. Although I will say one of my favorite experiences of that is if you ever get to see Rodney Asher's The Nightmare with a, an audience, the audience turn on him as a filmmaker halfway through intentionally, and it's one of the most glorious things to watch. So if you ever, <laughs> that ever pops up anywhere, just go and watch the audience, watch that one. I'll keep an eye out. 
Yes. Um, so another big question, because I, I also know that you kind of you don't see what you do for work as just like, you know, you love programming, you love showing people films. You feel that there's a bigger responsibility in what you're trying to do in the work that you do, especially bringing out kind of unsung filmmakers, both past and present. Like what is what how do you kind of contextualize that for yourself of this huge responsibility you put on yourself? And when do you give yourself breaks and, and don't have that responsibility on the work? Hmm. There's a few ways to, to look at this, and, and I think it taps into the emotional part of, of programming, which is something that people don't necessarily talk about that much. And I'm not talking about the emotional perspective so much from, from my hopes and, and fears, you know, from the obvious things like really hoping that a series is going to take off or that people are going to come and respond to a film and, and five people show up. That happens to all of us, and that's, that's a blow, and that's something you have to, to process. Um, but really, the emotional side of it, um, goes into the the care and attention that you have to pay uh, when you're dealing with filmmakers who are ultimately artists, uh, who are not administrators, not always the most rational minute to minute people. That's why we love them, and that's why we love the work that they do. And it, and it and you have to be, you know, it's a learning curve. You, you get to um, you have to get your sea legs and get experience the longer you do it. But it, it varies on on filmmakers at different stages of their career. Filmmakers who are just emerging. Um, often need a lot of care and support, um, need to be built up, need, need that arm around their shoulder. And, you know, you really need to be 100% confident at all times that you're standing in front of their work, that you've done the research. So you know that um, you, you have the language and the toolkit and that your colleagues have the, the proper language and the toolkit to communicate the work properly. So you're not betraying their intentions um, as a filmmaker when you're presenting their work. Um, to, to the other spectrum, which is working with filmmakers who because it's a massively racist and exclusionary industry and has been historically, have been shut out um, for many years. So you might be super excited about this film that they made in 1972, um, but they've been making work that hasn't been funded or seen for 50 years since. And they might, might, they might not wanna talk about their film from 1972. So if they tell you to fuck off, because they don't wanna, you have to kind of take that, yeah. uh, you know, and that, is, that really is a part of this you know, understanding that you're, you're not always going to be filmmakers friends, even if you are deeply in love with their work and supporting them, you can feel um, guilted and rejected sometimes, but that is part and parcel of dealing with artists. So that is a big responsibility, but there's nothing that beats the joy of when um, all of those things come together and you feel that you've really been, you've paid respect to a filmmaker that you have not, not elevated because that, that is a very charged and, and um, ambiguous word. Um, exposed or, or or illuminated put, put, sh shone a light on their work that is that has brought it to new audiences that has helped particularly younger audiences who, who would not use who didn't see the work before not only see it but to understand it and to deepen and enrich their understanding of film history and that's the part i i like to play as, a, as an interlocutor of that history as a, as a film programmer and and by extension of that as a writer as well yeah, and how do you, because I always I always have so much respect for what you do because I sit very squarely in new films. Like I've always done festival programming, I work on films that are new. So my lens is very much like either the pool of that year or just what is available at this time. You're dealing with the whole of history of like cinema. So how do you, you know, in a lot of the things and goals you have for the work you're trying to illuminate or celebrate, how do you go about that process? Is it something where you're researching and something grabs you? Do you have this like long list you're just working your way through? How do you kind of contextualize and figure out, okay, this is the next program I want to do, or this is the next filmmaker I want to champion? It depends on, in, in many cases, on the state of the work um, and whether it needs restoration whether there are rights issues around it you know programmed work on vastly different timelines obviously now i work at criterion um i'm dealing with a lot longer leads working with filmmaker legacies and and so i have you know that long list never changes i've always had a long list of films and filmmakers that i'd like to work with but the timing's not always right so keeping the faith um allowing yourself room for, for disappointment that things don't come off is important but um when you're working with films that are available um, again, it depends on um, what, what, what platform you're programming from. To give you a specific example at BAM, um, I, I, you know, first and foremost, I need to give a shout out to Gina Duncan, who hired me at BAM, um, who's just an extraordinary leader and a, and a fantastic person. And 
um, probably, you know, probably the reason I'm doing what I'm doing now, because up, up to that point, I'd been strictly a freelancer. Um, and I'd been based in the UK. And actually, it's probably worth, I, I apologise, I'm deviating from your question. Yeah. But just to map out some of that chronology. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm in the States is not because I turned up at Grand Central one day full of hope with one of the, you know, polka dot knapsack things. But because um, my wife is American, she lived with me in the UK. Um, for a number of years and she decided um, for work reasons to go back and I was freelancing at the time um, so that it made sense for me so I could do my you know freelancing from home just as easily as I could in the, the US as I could in the UK and I'd been building up uh, contacts in the US because I knew it was happening so that happened in 2014 so I've been based in the states for coming up to eight years and that's kind of an important pivot point because I was back in the UK after that to program uh, the Black Star project, which I could talk about in a minute. Um, but I started at BAM as a senior film programmer and later director of film programming in 2017. Uh, and one of the specific programs that I launched there was called Beyond the Canon. Um, and it was uh, the idea behind it was to essentially have a extend the idea of criticism as curation and have a dialogue, all these jargony words, have a dialogue with history, have a dialogue with the audience, but, but in, from a very earnest place of putting two films together. So it was a monthly double bill series. Um, and I would pair one film, the canonized film by a, a traditionally white Western male filmmaker, the type of filmmaker that has dominated the discourse around greatest films of all time, the canonized films. And I would, I would double bill that with a thematically or stylistically related film uh, by a filmmaker from a, from a de demographic group. That has historically been overlooked. So it's a filmmaker of color, a woman filmmaker, a queer filmmaker, or intersections thereof. So you have like um, Karen Kusama's girl fight playing with Raging Bull, um, Orson Welles' Touch of Evil with Carl Franklin's One False Move, or um, Richard Pryor's incredible Jojo Dancer, Your Life is Calling, screening with Bob Fosse's All That Jazz. So you kind of get the idea. So, and, and I'd commission a, a new essay from a, a non-white male writer for each edition of that um, double bill. And the whole idea was to, yeah, ha have a, try and have a conversation with, with film history and not just, you know, you, you could, if you're an audience member, you could sit and watch the films and go home and take nothing from it. I think, okay, that was nice. But in the best case scenario, you're asking, you're looking at these films thinking, why has one been overlooked? Um, why has one not been overlooked? So that was that had a very broad canvas to choose from. Um, and a lot of the retrospective programs we did at BAM, which were very much in line with Gina's um, remit, you know, to to privilege margin hitherto marginalized filmmakers to to not be backward about that. And that was a great thing about BAM. You know, we didn't talk about diversity. We didn't sit there scratching our heads and doing internal panels. We just did the work. And that is what that's the dream, really when you're not worrying and talking about it, you're just actually doing stuff. You don't have to justify it to anybody. And I think we made an incredible amount of ground in just the two or three years that, that we, we did that work before the pandemic came along. So a number of major programs we did were um, dedicated to looking at women filmmakers in the new Hollywood era. So with me growing up as just a film fan reading, if I read Peter Biskin's book, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, I could be forgiven for thinking that women were in that period were there for looking at um, from that 67 Bonnie and Clyde to Heaven's Gate New, Ho New Hollywood era. So we did a program that was entirely women filmmakers in that in that era. Um, we did a Chicano Cinema Pioneers program. We did a Black 90s program. Um, and all of these things were like making accessible work that had been overlooked. So we had all of history to pick from, but we looked at parameters. We looked at the stories we wanted to tell. And we were very, very clear with how we told them. We, we were very, um, you know, we were very harmonious. I mentioned earlier for people working in institutions, we were harmonious with our marketing and, and PR departments so that everybody knew was singing essentially from the same hymn sheet. When it came to Blackstar, um, that was a BFI project that I was, I was hired to program. When I came on board, they had the title and, and the idea was it'd be about black cinema. Um, but obviously black cinema is often maybe less so now because I think we have seen some really interesting developments in recent years but the idea of black cinema as a genre in unto itself you know I, I'm, I'm grateful for the work of writers like Michael B Gillespie whose book film blackness everybody should should order immediately 
and before that, Bell Hook, Greg Tate, um, James Snade, Ed Guerrero, for all of these people for complicating ideas about what black cinema is. Um, so that I, I kind of set the parameter on myself to take the title literally Black Star and look at the idea of black stardom, iconography. How has it been informed um, historically, industrially? Who, are, who have been black stars in different eras and to whom? How can we have little mini programs that can speak to each other? And it was a great collaborative process. There are things I'd go back and change now, but you know, again, you, you've once you have this big subject as a as a programmer, I'm always thinking about ways to to break it down and have things in conversation and dialogue with each other that aren't overwhelming. And I'm always thinking about how this is being communicated to an audience. And I also care if people come to the yeah. uh, to the screenings. Um, it's really important to me that. Um, there can be a slight sense of, well, from in some circles, we've got great taste, here's the films, if you don't come, that's your loss, which sits at odds with, um, I suppose, my philosophy about it, which is you have to have a bit of showmanship, you have to actually get out there. Um, and I think in, in one of the first things I said today was about that not maybe being such the way in Britain. Um, <laughs> Which I don't know if that's still true or not, or if I'm just interpreting that wrong, but I seem to feel that there's a bit more of an earnestness in the state mm. that's taken me a little while to warm up to. Me too, yeah. Um, culturally speaking, but I've actually come to quite like it. Doesn't yeah. mean I can't still enjoy, you know, rising damp <laughs> or, or brass eyes. Do you know what I mean? But I think that that idea of showmanship, being enthusiastic about what you're presenting is really helpful. And crucially, it helps with filmmakers. Yeah. You know, sh not not being um, standoffish with filmmakers. If you if you show that a filmmaker, particularly one who's been overlooked, that you're really enthusiastic about putting their work out, that really matters to them because they are artists and artist confidence. Not that not that our confidence doesn't vacillate wildly, but artist confidence goes really up and down. And um, being there for them as best you can as a program is really important. I think that's such an interesting point because I think obviously you know the kind of the sheer work of programming kind of attracts introverts right because you have to be able to watch in volume at home a lot of work um I'm certainly very introverted so the moment you said showman I was like oh god because I'm terrible at that but in service of other people's work I can do it because I love championing other people's work so you put me on a stage to be able to talk about a film I love very different ball game and I think it is an interesting thing for programs coming up of like being able to hold those two things and learn how to do that and you also mentioned you know in in that the kind of presentation of films and what it means you know it isn't somebody's taste i know the, the moment you said the word taste you knew i was going to follow up with this question but i it's something i think about a lot of the perception of programming right of what is the skill i think a lot of people do just think it is i have great taste i'm going to get hired to program and show people stuff and for me it's a huge amount more than that there's a huge amount of skill in there where do you feel like a, you know kind of informed taste fits in versus your own taste versus your voice as a programmer in what you're kind of building how do how do you kind of grapple with those things that's a great question and i'll come to that in a second but i did just want to talk briefly about the the showmanship aspect of it because yeah. it, it yeah. taps into something um that i think is really important to say mm -hmm. um and maybe i wouldn't have said it in the past because it might have sounded a bit too much like a broadside but <laughs> um in q and a's when i say showmanship i don't mean be a you know a twirling cape carnival barker and take up all the space yeah you know as, as a q a moderation you're, you're very very good at it i mean it is an art form and when you're public speaking is a, is a big part of the job especially if you're working with an institution or um, whether you're putting on your own events independently um and i think it's really important like not to center yourself yeah you know um the audience is there to hear the filmmaker um so, so when i say showmanship i just mean um, studying the people that you think do Q and A's really well, yeah. And and remember that everybody wants you to do well when you're up there. People can be nervous; that's completely natural. But when I'm a paying spectator, I want the Q and A, the, the, the Q and A moderator, the host, to, to do really well and to facilitate an interesting conversation with the filmmaker that I might learn something from. Um, and I think sometimes, particularly in the era of distributors insisting on celebrity moderators who yeah. never moderated a conversation in their life because they might shift a few more tickets. Believe me, it never moves the needle that much on tickets. And if you've only got 20 minutes, you know, I'd much rather have a focused targeted conversation from someone who views Q&A moderation um, as, a, as a professional thing. 
And I think I think you're right to say showmanship because I've seen you do intros and Q and A's. I, I was always really impressed by how you do them because you're very good at kind of setting the stage for what people are about to watch in the intro. You know, you bring a lot of research. You actually set the tone of the screening, even to the point of I know you do playlists in in screening rooms and you build an atmosphere of what what the program is beyond just the film to the season. And I've always really respected that. And then, you know, in the Q and A's too, of knowing that you're almost that facilitator for the audience. You're you're protecting the filmmaker so they feel safe to be able to speak and also you are the voice of the audience i've always thought you had you you hold those whole screenings extremely well thanks i mean it comes it comes with experience i mean the first thing i ever introduced at the bfi was uh, a film called outside the law by rashid bushareb i'd never done it before i never really had a mentor so i i didn't didn't really have any tips so i didn't ask for a podium yeah. and i had like an eight page thing with a staple in it and i was like holding it against my hip and i nearly dropped my microphone and it went on forever. It seemed to go on forever. It was like outside conventional time and space. And I remember a guy in the front row went into his bag and took out the, the Financial Times and opened it <laughs> and started reading it. And I thought, right, that that is uh, as good a as good a teachable moment as any that I need to tighten these things up. So so the intros I've always tried to make, you know, the, the sweet spot for for a pre film intro is is five seven minutes for me never to impose too much of my own critical perspective on a film, but just to, as I said before, just to open up some space for the audience to, to maybe spot some things or to get a bit of grounding. Um, but then on, on the taste question, yeah, I mean, there is probably a misconception around, perhaps related to the, the explosion of the word curation mm. and it's increasing meaninglessness in some ways. You know, everybody, everybody's a curator. I'm like, I don't, you know, people curate their plates at restaurants and, and so on you know and so forth and, and you have to drilling down into what that word actually means but taste is is extremely subjective and i think it is it's a factor in what we do because we want to share stuff we like yeah. but it, it, in a way it's the same answer it depends on what what community what public you're serving what institution you're working at um and it would be it's a misconception to think that everything that i've pro ever programmed i've loved um, I think it's important, an important point to raise that there are multiple ethical discussions that, that come up. There's one happening right now with, with um, the Sundance Film Festival and the, the appallingly titled uh, Jihad Rehab film, which is worth reading up on for anyone in the audience. Yeah. Um, ethical questions um, that, that kind of go well beyond taste and go, go, go towards things like filmmaker safety and institutional reputation and, and all of those things. Um, so taste is a part of it, but it's not number one. I wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't, if I wasn't arrogant enough to think that my taste was worth sharing. And yeah. if I didn't get some real joy out of exposing people to, to films for the first time, you know, nothing makes me happier than when people you know that like when we released deep cover and criterion and people go, I can't believe I'd never seen this. Yeah. You know, I, I love this movie. How come I'd not seen it before? And I think that then I think because of my taste. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, um, it's not it's not easy the deadpan is not easy in this format but but really i think you have so too, to because that's where informed taste comes in right so because there yeah. is skill behind that taste so you can say it's your taste because you come with a wealth of experience that got you to that point which is also taste this is where you, it's interesting you can, you, can, you can say that but yeah it, it's so it's on the list of things but it can't necessarily be number one we've had these conversations a lot yeah. um and we've all been in positions where we've Especially when you're you're not the autocrat, when you're you know you're promo promogramming, I'm making up a new word, when you're yeah. programming um, by group or by committee or for a festival. So at BAM, at the same time that we did our repertory programming and had a hand in the first run, we also did BAM Cinema Fest, mm -hmm. which was a roughly kind of 20, 23 film program dedicated to um, new American independent cinema, um, New York premieres of premieres excuse me i'm speaking to an english audience i, I haven't lost the accent but it's the <laughs> idioms that are going and the pronunciation um premieres um of, of american independent film and obviously when you're um programming by committee you have to have a little bit of give and take yeah. um there is you know you have to be thinking well is this film going to do well with an audience i might not i might not love it but as long as i don't have deep rooted ideological or ethical issues with this film and actually, I'm, I'm coming back to the same point as I did before, because there was one Q&A that I think you were at with a particular film mm -hmm. where, the, where the filmmaker came under real heavy fire from the, from the audience afterwards. 
and I was able to stand there and step in a little bit and, and actually come out and say, you know, peek, peek out from behind the curtain, Richard Pryor in, in the Wiz style and say, look, I, I ethically, I stand behind this film. I programmed it for a reason. And I think the filmmaker is coming from an, an ethical place. So that, yeah. that was one of those occasions where, you know, you don't want to show, you almost don't want to show exactly how the sausage is made, have to, you know, come out and say these things, but you have to be able to stand there with the filmmaker. If you can't, if you don't feel that you can stand in front of a film, in front of an audience and protect the filmmaker, you can't program it exactly. because that's where real trouble lies. Um, and and uh, I've seen that happen and it's really unpleasant. So that would be my, the main takeaway from that. Yeah. It's not really about taste, except it is. Um, but really, you have to be able to morally, ethically, personally be able to, to stand behind a piece of work if you're going to present it publicly and particularly get people to pay money to come and see it. Absolutely. And so, I mean, one of the things I was curious about, I think in over your career, you've programmed in so many different ways in different capacities to different audiences. So you have Black Star, which started at the BFI, but then traveled and became a traveling season. Um, you know, you have BAM, which is venue programming. It was all happening within one venue. You're now with Criterion, you have Janice, so you're working distribution, physical media, streaming. Do you have different considerations based on where you think the film will be shown and how? And if so, my bigger question, I guess, centers around Black Star. Did you tweak the program based on it going into different countries and different communities, or was it always imagined? Or did you think you didn't need to? I mean, I have those those different considerations of who is going to be watching it and where culturally, is that a factor? Yes. It, it, short answer is yes, it is a factor. Um, it's a really obvious answer, or not an obvious answer, but a, a clear answer for Black Star because the BFI program was 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. The program was enormous, um, whereas the, the program at MoMA was a lot slimmer. And in some ways, that was better for storytelling. Mm -hmm. It was also a partnership with a, a fantastic uh, curator and writer called Desan Lopez Cassell, um, who is a good friend and we were kind of thrown together in 2017 because she was then a, a, a fellow at the Museum of Modern Art mm -hmm. and was working on a, a photographic exhibition downstairs called Making, Making Faces, Images of Empowerment and Exploitation on Film, or words to that effect. And it was about the early years of cinema. Uh, and we were able to, in a much slimmer program, tell a much more focused story and didn't have to worry about these kind of sub subcategories and, and thinking about, oh my God, are we... Are we telling the, the, the black British story effectively? You know, um, are we telling the, the, the black European film star? Story, da, da. So we could actually focus it more on an, an American perspective, um, which was a lot easier. Obviously, again, there is a different, um, it, it's too far too complicated to go into it in any, in any great detail here, but there is a, a massively different discourse around race and how race operates in society. Um, and the extent to which people feel comfortable or empowered to talk about it in the UK versus the US. Um, so the way that the, the series is written about, the way that you're able in a way to, to converse about it is, is a very different, um, very different situation. Black Star then went to TIFF uh, and it kind of closely followed the model of uh, the MoMA program. Um, so in that case, yeah, um, the streaming versus theatrical question is, 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 a, is a vexed and, and challenging one. Um, obviously, I was working in theatrical exhibition at BAM when the pandemic struck, and we then suddenly went into this strange corridor of uncertainty, a, a cricket or football term, depending on where you're coming from, um, about virtual, the virtual theatrical experience. And would you, you know, would you insist that people had to start this film at 7 p.m.? Um, or it's bad luck for them. Yeah. Um, and I think we've just been to, the description said that we, we'd come fresh from Sundance, which was, was amusing. Um, <laughs> here I am fresh, fresh, from, fresh from my couch. Um, <laughs> but they, you know, for, for, for premieres, they, they will kind of impose a, a limited window um, and then extend for three days for second screening. So in, in the streaming space for festivals, that's still being worked out. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's, um, ambitious to expect people to, to from home under pandemic conditions to mirror the, the, the in-person theatrical experience. And we quickly gave up on that. Yeah. Um, 
screaming uh, repertory stuff is particularly kind of thematically um, content um, tricky or challenging material like on for example the BAM series on whiteness where we did a really fun series in collaboration with Claudia Rankin's Racial Imaginary Institute where we screened a whole bunch of films and explicitly presented them through the lens of, of whiteness so uh, Ferris Bueller for example was just this is the exemplar of white privilege and we had a little introduction by Fariha beforehand which was fun um, the Godfather Part Two is a film about becoming white in America, and and that worked because of the the in, I think in person experience and the fact that we could have a contextual introduction before they were there was a real vibe there that people could enter into the spirit of putting a program like that together online is a bit different because there isn't that there isn't that unity of experience. You can record an introduction, and I, I have just done for a reggae on film program um, for the Criterion Channel, which is like 10, 11 films that's a lot tighter, but that is under a theme that is not as open to interpretation or potential controversy or, or multiple readings as the, the spectre of whiteness, for example. Um, but I think you can still do um, innovative, interesting programming. I'm a huge fan of what um, another gaze or another screen is doing. Obviously, ICO and, and Cinema of Ideas, I'm really like chuffed to see this, this taking shape. Um, so there are ways to do innovative, interesting programming online, mm. um, but it's just, again, al allowing for, for the realities of the in-person experience versus the theatrical and not trying to directly map one onto the other. Um, but so, we're all still, I think, working it out. That makes sense. And I really, I'm conscious of time and I really want to bring up your writing because I don't want to miss the huge part of the work you do in that way too. How do you, you know, do you see yourself as a critic first and foremost, or is it more you are a film writer that goes beyond just pure criticism? And how do you marry the two, or do you not marry the two practices together? Well, I mean, I, I was a critic up until, uh, I think the date was like July 2017. When my, when my last critical review was published, which mm -hmm. was of Catherine Bigelow's film, Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, I have a great, great deal of respect for Catherine Bigelow as a filmmaker, but I despise that film. Um, and I said so in no uncertain terms. But then I started a job as a, as a film programmer um, in a world where I would have to navigate the, the distribution sphere and potentially work with filmmakers. So, so from, from an ethical perspective, I had to kind of recalibrate and I wasn't someone who was gonna say, right, you can only hire me if I can keep writing criticism. It just so happened that writing was starting to drive me crazy by that point anyway. It yeah. became a real ordeal for me to, to write and express myself on the page um, because I was doing it for such a long time. And when you're, when you're writing to live, a lot of the joy um, sat, seeps out of it. So I certainly began as a critic and I wrote a lot of critical work as a freelancer for a number of different publications. But then the programming bug really kind of hit Mm. um or, or bit me or whatever the metaphor is and the the n now i try to write for enjoyment when yeah. i get the opportunity and I, I think i always used to enjoy doing features and interviews more anyway yeah um but i've always seen curation as an extension of an ultimately indivisible from criticism um obviously not not the not the act of it but but the idea of intervening uh yeah. in a culture hopefully posing questions um, to established ways of doing things and, and asking why things can't be a different way. And I think you can do that just as readily by, um, by programming and curation as you can by criticism. And the last thing I'll say as well, the, the landscape for criticism has, has changed incredibly, like with the advent of social media and, and letterboxed and so on. Mm. And I think that has, has borne some really interesting fruit and it's borne some rotten fruit as well. Um, <laughs> And it's it's hard to distinguish, it's hard to, to navigate that exactly sometimes. But but the landscape is changing, and it, like everything at the moment, it's stuff we just have to to navigate and pay attention to. But it's personally, true. I always you know I'm very grateful for the space that I have with Field Notes, Field of Vision, where I can be very focused on on the practice and art of nonfiction filmmaking. You know, and I still enjoy kind of deep diving into the certain areas. And we have a question which actually kind of links into that. You've mentioned before when you were doing research, you look back on past writing and when you're thinking about kind of bringing films back into the kind of current sphere, um, where do you go to find older writing pre-digital age for that kind of research or to see how people were talking about films in the past? 
uh, I mean, libraries. Yeah. Uh, where possible, the underrated, the underrated good old library. Um, <laughs> books that I've bought and forgotten about. <laughs> yeah. I think we're maybe all a bit guilty of that. Um, yeah. And then go, going back through something that's great about Criterion, I've always, yeah, I'm very you know honoured to work for them now, and I enjoy my job. Um, that whole idea of like supplements, the supplemental features. This is not writing, obviously, or it is in some cases because they write great liner notes for mm. their editions, but they're always packed with like things like commentaries and mm. making of and, and supplements, especially on the technical side. And you find out some great anecdotes and things um, from from these editions. So I'm really grateful for not just Criterion but other kind of boutique labels, old magazines that I've kept. And you, you know, you can find loads of stuff online if, if you know where to look. Yeah, it kind of leads into another question I was thinking about is around like the idea of, you know, in programming curation and writing, you're trying to inform culture or at least bring things into a cultural conversation or even just give people an experience if it's purely that. But the, the idea of permanence or contributing to something that is long leading, often, you know, the work we do disappears based on timing. How do you kind of equate what you're trying to do because I even just think I you know I keep program books from festivals because I know I may not have access to those things from past and I want to know what was shown then and I also look for filmmakers that way what how do you kind of reconcile with you know a lot of the work we do does kind of have an end point or is time dependent like tears in the rain <laughs> um I mean it's a good question I mean I keep all of my archive stuff it's in the garage I mean, God knows when it will see the light of day, but I've always enjoyed ephemera generally. I've always been a bit of a collector, um, so I enjoy that. Um, I, you know, I, I'm always grateful when people write about the work that I do, that, that we do at, at Criterion and that we did at BAM, and, and I'll keep that stuff. But yeah, I mean, there is that idea, and, and this has been especially difficult post-pandemic. You know, yeah. you don't get that. You know, for example, you can't, it's hard to put into words the feeling of, of putting on like, of working for two years to put together the, the Marlon Riggs program. Mm -hmm. And then the opening night, you have 350 people watching Tongues Untied on the big screen, with standing room only. Mm -hmm. And you have people crying and you have this, this massively diverse audience of like, young, old, multiracial, mm -hmm. just massively kind of diverse queer audience and then it's and then it's over right it, it is that moment so you have to try and hold on to those feelings yeah. and those experiences when you're lucky enough to have them mm. um but again it, it, much the same way that my, my last um my last answer about libraries risk sounding glib the, the photographs you know yeah. take pictures make sure you've got someone on hand because it can be lovely to look back on yeah, you know, and I think and it, yeah. It, the it's documentation like, is important. You know, I, I have to say, like, like again, that's something else. A bit like my my rant about you know doing Q and A's properly. Yeah. Make make sure that you've got someone. That, you know, you can forget these things. And you, and you, after shit, did anybody take a picture? Yeah. What do you mean nobody took a picture? You know, build that in. If you're a programmer, have a little checklist of things that you always do. Yeah. Make sure that you have a podium or something that you can put. <laughs> This is the real basics that you can put your introduction on so you're not faffing around with, with the mic in your hip and the bloke doesn't whip out his financial time. <laughs> you know, make sure you've got someone with a half decent camera on side to, yeah. to take pictures so you can commemorate this moment and then potentially use it in your, your marketing. Just yeah. little things like that are really important. It's true. And, and the experience carries. I mean, one of my favorite things is always when someone says like, oh, I saw this great screening then and there. And you think, oh, yeah, that was when I did. You know, that's you, you have that kind of pride that it goes out and people remember these things. Um, that, was I know me. that was me. Just <laughs> <in there. laughs> uh, so another question, which I think is really good, that I hadn't had a chance to touch on. So thank you for asking it. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about earnestness in the US and the different conversations around race in the UK and the US. What are the kind of main differences in working in programming and film criticism between the US and the UK? And how do the professional landscapes differ in terms of resources, attitudes, and audiences? Great question. <sighs> it's a really good question. Um, I think if to, to, to um, 
the, the word that comes to my mind is, is freedom. I feel a bit freer to express myself here, yeah. to not risk uh, offending people, to, to um, you know, my first program at BAM, excuse me, in October 2017 was a program dedicated to exploring the ideas of and depictions of Franz Fanon on film. And I did, I did that on purpose because it was like, hang on, I can get away with this. Yeah. They're going to let me do this and, and actually go there and talk about white supremacy and revolution and these revolutionary ideas and do it in a, um, in a not-for-profit public programming context. Um, not saying that kind of program has never happened in the UK. I know that Isaac Julian um, did, did a Fanon program years ago and, and, and I found that out in the Black Film Bulletin which has been uh, magnificently revived recently by Jan Asante and Mel Hoyes and June Giovanni at the BFI. So congratulations to them. Cause I, I hang on to every word from the Black Film Bulletins from, from years ago, um, made by the African Caribbean unit at the BFI in the nineties by Gaylene Gould and um, June Giovanni. So that, that work's really important, but that, that work was kind of curtailed at its peak. Yeah. You know, you had the Black World at the BFI in 2005, Black Star 2016. And it feels, I'm not saying that those weren't great initiatives, but it feels a little more intermittent. Yeah. And that the idea of, of, of building on those seems to be more of a struggle. And I found that, not that the, the state is a, is a panacea of racial, <laughs> racial harmony and that we're light years ahead. I mean, the discourse is different, you know, in many ways that we don't have enough time for me to go into here. Um, but I think the people's comfort about talking about issues is at a different level yeah. um, and one that I'm, I, I'm, I'm happier about um, and, and in, in terms of the earnestness question there's just more of a sense of like digging people up I, I feel that I could again I could be wrong I haven't been in the UK for ages you know mm. I, I haven't been in the I haven't worked in the UK for, for eight years I mean Black Star as a which, which was great but as a uh, you know that was a different type of experience because in and out mm. but I feel that there's there's a, a more of a sense of momentum over yeah. here that, that you can build upon um, and anything I can you know and, and, I, and I hope that 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 is the case in the UK I don't know I haven't I haven't worked there for a while but I've certainly felt that and that specific again I want to shout out Gina uh, for creating that space at BAM I'm repeating myself but we didn't we didn't talk about diversity we just did the work yeah. And I can't tell you how freeing that is, like spiritually and emotionally, to be able to get on with it. Not yeah. have to prove yourself, not have to do panels, not have to do training. Yeah. You're, you're doing it. You're doing the work. That's what you're there to do. And the speed at which we were able to build something. And, and the programs have been influential. You know, frankly, the Black, the Black 90s program at BAM has had a real knock-on effect um, since with, with, with the Criterion work. Mm -hmm. we, we've put out a number of films from that program uh, and that clearly that that periodization of that work and the way that it was written about in the press and the audiences that we got it was a major deal it was you know and and a number of those films are, are coming to, to uh, have come to criterion already will yeah. continue and we're working with filmmakers from that period so you can see a clear knock-on effect um the afrofuturism program that began actually at the bfi as well as part of their mm -hmm. science blockbuster moved to, to BAM in 2015, and then started on the Criterion channel in um, 2020. So keep your notes, because you never know where things might pop up in different forms. But I just feel that sense of momentum here, which I'm grateful for. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, we because we have a UK audience, we wouldn't go into this, but there's a whole vast difference between saying East Coast, East Coast and West Coast programming and film culture and all of those things. We could even, we could talk for an hour about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I want to be really clear that, I, you know, I have to, I'm being completely, I'm speaking the I statements, you know, my, my sense of this, and I haven't been in the UK for a while, and I think there's some really good work happening over there, um, not least the Black Film Bulletin coming back to life, and we are parable, you know, and I think there's some great stuff happening, and I'm really happy to see it, and I just hope that that momentum can, can, can move forward, and that people doing that work don't feel they have to be asking questions or justifying their existence, that they're actually empowered to get on with it because that's the most important thing you can do. I agree with you too, though. I think for me, my hope for the UK is 
that there's just more of an independent filmmaking community that grows more because I think we, we often get stuck in the UK by the institutions and whether they let us through the doors. So I really am looking forward to, and I think it's happening certainly more than when I last worked there. I'm seeing younger people doing it their own way and kind of ignoring the institutions and whether they're permitted in or not. And that's really exciting to me. So I think it's, it's brewing in a way that in the US, there's no national film funding, there's no national support that they had to do it. So it's just a case of, they're further ahead in that space. That's a huge, a huge point. It's an important one to make. And thinking critically about working within and outside institutions is, is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the NHS or the BBC, things that are kind of hotly contested. I, you know, we don't have them over here in, in the States. The healthcare system, you know, is, is, is insane. Yeah. You know, so there are, there are these very proud traditions, institutional traditions in the UK. But there are there is also great virtue in questioning institutions, and you know I've been so inspired by the work of someone like Gemma Desai, um, mm. who who's been doing some just in, incredible work, selfless and difficult work, um, thinking about what institutions are, who they benefit, uh, and their histories, and that's happening over here. Like 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 um, people like Abby and, and, and Abby Sun and Chris, people who are actually doing that work. Chris yeah. Barkman uh, of looking at institutional histories and laying stuff bare. I think it's really important work to do. I have a great last question to end on. Uh -oh. uh, what film or films do you watch when you want to switch off? And then there's a second part, which I will see if we can get to the second part is what filmmaker movement or decade do you come back to again and again to learn and grow your knowledge? Two parter. The first question, the first answer, what film do I come back to? Um, mm. There'll be, I mean, I, I, there's a film called called Lock that I I, I, I quite liked. <laughs> I wanted to know if this would come up. Well, I had to mention it because people would say, "Why didn't you mention Lock?" Well, no, maybe no, nobody would say that, but it's it's just I a would. film with, with Tom Hardy sat in a car shouting at his his car phone for ninety minutes. And I do like the film, but it's almost become a bit of a running joke because I think it's really kind of funny how people like um, stand for films, like people like the fan culture attaches itself to films, and it's always been a kind of um, a source of self amusement to me to kind of present as a stand for a film that nobody gives a shit about. That I just, do. Am, that just I amuses do. me. I um, love your love for Locke. I like Locke a lot. I think it's a, a good film. I think the one that I really do come back to often is To Live and Die in LA by William Friedkin, yeah. um, which is one of it's just an absolutely unhinged 80s dirty cop thriller. <laughs> and this, I, you know, one, one of my biggest sources of guilt as a programmer is I've got this viewing list, you yeah. know, that never gets any shorter so every time i'm watching a film that i've seen before yeah. you know my soul shrivels up a bit more but i think that film is just great and it's like super exciting and like the 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 absolute um pinnacle of what that genre that neo-noir mm. dirty cop film should be it's completely crazy like the, the maddest car chase um second question slightly more sober and serious answer would be i think the the, the, the workshop movement um, of the early 80s and beyond in the UK, uh, specifically the filmmaking groups, Black Audio Film Collective, Sankofa and Cheddar, um, who were all influenced in various ways by writings of people like Stuart Hall, who, whose name just looms incredibly large, um, like increasingly, like so many new collections of his work keeps coming out. There was a really nice BBC documentary, a radio documentary about him recently. And I find that a lot of his thinking and writing that has informed that work I just wish more people read it now because these these ideas about whether it's political correctness or freedom of speech or the rise of the right and centrism they kind of get relitigated as as if they're new but Stuart Hall was writing about that years and years and years ago and, and writing about it in a way that feels extremely fresh and the work that came out of the people that were really influenced by him there's a level of craft and ambition to it um, the Black Audio Film Collective work, whether it's Handsworth Songs or Testament or Twilight City, that I keep coming back to over and over again. I'll never get tired of watching that that work. So I think that's probably my answer for that. Look at that, the timing. Perfect. I wow. see Salute coming back. <laughs> I've come back now. <laughs> um, thank you both so much, Ashley. Thank you so much for just, yeah, just sharing your, your experiences of film programming and criticism and just you know as we were saying before just kind of taking those opportunities and being in the right place at the right time and and also you know 
there's obviously a lot of people who have really championed your your work have taken a chance on you too which is like great you know to acknowledge that too um so thank you so much i mean it's just been fascinating i actually asked that last question about what you <laughs> thank you and i, I, I have to give another shout out to now that's what i call music 12 it's very <laughs> it's a foundational text i'm telling you it's great stuff um and charlotte thank you so much for really just just firing off some really brilliant questions really really thoughtful so you know the conversation really took some brilliant kind of directions and very intellectually stimulating so thank you so much for, thank you for having me it was really fun yeah and, um, it's lovely to hear both of you as brits kind of you know in the states um <laughs> hearing how you're figuring it all out um so i'm just gonna just quickly say thank you again to everyone who came and um just to tell you about on just our next event stitched up protests in the garment industry curated by joe reed and that's starting on the 19th of february so please tune back in and yeah thank you thank you so much again ashley and charlotte for your time and your wisdoms thank you so much bye thank you. everyone bye, -bye.